Greetings and salutations. Today we will be covering the Inokashira Park Dismemberment Incident. On the morning of April 23rd, 1994, a janitor working at Inokashira Park in Tokyo was emptying out trash cans when she made a most frightening discovery. As she opened up one of the trash cans, she noticed a garbage bag, which at first appeared to contain fish or some meat. The park being a veritable haven for cats, led the cleaner to attempt to remove the fish and let the cats chow down on some tasty treats. However, there was a rather notable roadblock preventing this. The bag itself had been tied with a rather strong knot, tied so tightly that regardless of how much she strained, she could not loosen it to open the bag. Becoming frustrated, she took a chunk of bamboo and tore the bag open. Once the bag was opened, however, she was assailed with an unfamiliar yet terrible smell. It was an odor so nauseating that she knew it could not just be some rotten fish. The smell caused her to have severe nausea to the point she wholeheartedly felt sick. However, appropriately enough for the saying, it seemed that curiosity did kill the cat. Due to her feeling the need to know what was inside the bag that caused such a stench. As she took a look into the now open bag, she was met by a terrifying sight, that of a severed human ankle. The flesh laying on top of a pile of human remains that largely made up the bag. Deciding to look further into things, she found a pair of hands, two feet, a right shoulder, and a section of the upper torso, along with its ribs, still hanging onto the remains of its former owner. This, along with a minutia of other pieces of human meat, were what she was met with. Meat being the best descriptor since it seemed a little bit too processed to really call it flesh. When investigative units and the police arrived, they began to examine the contents of the garbage cans, which led them to find a total of 14 individual plastic bags containing anywhere between 24 to 27 chunks of human flesh spread out in a series of garbage cans all along the park. Over a range of 1.056 miles or around 1.6 kilometers to use the local measurement system. Said pieces made up about a third of an adult male's human body. Each piece was further still contained within an individual perforated drainage bag. They had been placed there before being placed in the garbage bags proper. The investigation discovered that the type of knot that was used on the bags was one more frequently used by those involved in fishing or medical staff. However, even with all the man's remains, the man's head had not been located. With the lack of a head, the identification of the victim was made substantially more difficult. That is without noting that whoever did this also patiently took the time to remove the fingerprints off of the body, removing the tips with a blade with such skill that had not been found lacking. They also damaged the palms with an abrasive, removing any chance of a palm print being properly found. It ended up taking authorities three days to identify the man due to the damage that had been done to the body, which had made an autopsy significantly more difficult. Some slight prints were available from the palm, which was allowed due to the autopsy, being performed at Curran University Hospital, along with the DNA test to identify the victim. Now, they would be armed with the victim's identity, 35-year-old Seichi Kawamura. With this, they would be able to find out that he was a run-of-the-mill architect. Nothing that would draw the kind of attention that would lead to such a gruesome fate. They were also able to find out that his residence was notably close to the park where his remains were found. Specifically, his residence was about a mile from the park. Now, even though they had identified the victim, his head, along with the majority of his torso, were never found, meaning that around a third of his body was nowhere to be found, just vanished into thin air. And seeing how the rest of his body was sliced into 20 centimeter, which would be about 7.8 inch pieces of meat, it is unlikely that the head or the torso would ever be found in any way that was identifiable. However, they did find out by observing the corpse that a regular handsaw and an average knife was used to create these injuries. This was determined due to how the body was damaged itself. Authorities believe that the preciseness of the cuts was notable enough to lead them 
to suspect that the individual who did this to poor Seichi had extensive medical training. They believed it was likely a doctor or a surgeon, or at least at the time they believed so. After the body parts had been cut, the remains had been methodically washed to the point it seemed obsessive, along with noting that the remains had been almost fully exsanguinated. It had also been detailed that there had been no signs of him being battered or any impact damage along with lack of any signs of poisoning. However, there had been traces of internal bleeding within the flesh. They, by analyzing the muscle, it is strongly believed that Seichi was vivisected torturously, basically sliced and diced while he was alive, like that straight up from Hostel. This begs the question, how had a successful yet mild-mannered man been met with such a nightmarish fate befitting of a horror movie? Before we even begin to postulate that question, we must go back two days before his body was found, or rather, two days before Seichi's remains had been found. Seichi had gone to a nomikai, which is a drinking party, one where the employer expects employees to take part in, or at least to some extent. This is part of the work culture, a social aspect. Although it's not strictly required, it is beneficial for you to go. The closest thing I could think of for Americans would be something like an office Christmas party. You might not like Christmas, you might not celebrate Christmas, but it benefits you to go. He, along with a lot of his colleagues, will go to the area of Takadanobaba station in order to celebrate a recent promotion. Afterwards, it's reported that he sang karaoke and continued to drink without any form of umbrage. Afterwards, he and two of his companions left on a train to Kichijoji Station. From there, he would reportedly walk back to his apartment by himself. However, it must be noted that the route he took was notably different than the one he would normally take. It would be at about 11.30 p.m. that witnesses reportedly sighted Seichi arguing with a couple of guys just outside a department store. On the afternoon of April 22nd, his wife, who at the time was carrying their child, filed a missing persons report due to how strange it was for her husband, who had never stayed out late at night, to not have come back. It would be at approximately 4 a.m. on the 23rd that the two as of yet unidentified men would have been seen entering the park with a clutch of plastic bags. It would not be until 11 a.m. when a custodian found the bag that Seichi's body would be found. Now that we've made our way back around, let's go forward. Investigators found it nigh impossible to discern a motive due to the fact that Seichi was relatively well liked and was seen positively by those around him. And he also was seen as not having any enemies or anyone who would want or who had been slighted by him. His death caused rumors of cult activity along with criminal organizations such as the Yakuza and other types of gangs to mill about in the surrounding area, regardless of there being no proof of such activity going on at all. However, one of the more interesting theories was that Seichi had fallen victim to human organ traffickers, his missing head and torso potentially being sold to the highest bidder to use from anything from displays to transplants to even cannibalistic rituals, if that is considerable. Regardless of the motive, it is safe to assume there was more than one assailant involved. There are statements going so far as to say that when they saw how the remains had been handled and packaged, that they realized that this could not have been done alone by a single individual. It was estimated that somewhere around four to five people working in what would appear to be an assembly line method had been divvied up the tasks of cutting up the body into predetermined lengths with a handsaw, while another adjusted each piece to the proper size, and yet another one of them washing them, along with a final person methodically packing them into the plastic bags. This gives a feeling that it was carried out calmly in a place that had been pre-prepared for a long time before they had acted. They were potentially people who belonged to a radical cult was subjected to strong mind control. The reasoning for this being that because any normal human would experience some amount of nausea, headaches, or the urge to run away when cutting up their fellow man to such an extent, and seeing as these people didn't, they would not be considered normal. One of the final and most likely theories that authorities would consider 
is that it was potentially a case of mistaken identity. It was noted that a young street vendor whose name was never openly revealed, but who would be referred to by the media as Mr. A had been staying around the park at the time of the incident. And it was noted that he had a strong resemblance to Seichi and that some of Seichi's co-workers had gone up to Mr. A prior to the incident believing him to be their co-worker. However, as it stands, there is little to no information publicly known about Mr. A himself other than he was noted to accidentally have stepped into activities of a peculiar nature with individuals of a country's intelligence agency. According to the information given by Mr. A, the story goes as follows. He had noticed a group of foreigners, apparently Koreans, working as street vendors setting up shop without a license or a permit or any kind of legal permission right beside his legally legitimate business. Believing that they were creeping into his business's territory, he sabotaged their stalls and employed some particular individuals to frighten them. Unfortunately for all those involved, the street vendors would be in fact undercover North Korean agents. And further still, he had gotten in their way of their mission, or supposedly had done so, leading him to supposedly spend the next few weeks on the lam, switching from hotel to hotel, never staying in one place too long, constantly followed by them, stalked. That was until the end of the Inakashira Park incident. Later when he saw Seichi on a picture in the news, he was met with the realization that he had been the intended target and that Seichi had been mistaken for him and essentially he had put the weight of another man's death onto himself through his actions. However, Mr. A's claims remain unverified. Despite Seichi's family and friends and acquaintances openly and thoroughly being interviewed along with a very thorough search through his apartments, no further clues would be found and to this day, the people who butchered him remain unidentified. Now, in 1995, a major earthquake and the Tokyo subway sarin gas attacks occurred back to back, causing a large amount of the investigative resources that were put into his case to be drawn away from him, diverted into these incidents. And as the interest in the case began to diminish, News coverage was deferred to new and more current events. Unfortunately, the statute of limitations ran out in 2009. However, even though the statute of limitations law involving murders was removed recently, it was only revoked for cases occurring from 1995 onwards, not even a full year off of the brutal slaying of Seichi. If you have remained with me until the end, I thank you, and I do hope you stay tuned and subscribe for more content.